Hello listeners, in this video I will discuss about green chemistry, its goal, its need and limitations of green chemistry. We will also discuss the 12 principles of green chemistry. Let us begin with the importance of chemical industries. We all know that industrialization has brought technological advances that improved people's health and expanded their lifespan. By harnessing the raw resources, industry produces a number of products for consumers. Some of the benefits of industries are, they provide us medicine which improve health, they provide fertilizers to boost agricultural production, they also give us chemicals that are used for sanitation. Chemical industries also provide employment. Other than this, there are a number of benefits of chemical industries. However, most industries at one time were not concerned about the exposure, toxicity, hazard and effect of on environment by the chemicals produced or the waste generated by them. A number of industrial disasters occurred in past which affected human, wildlife and environment. Let us discuss some of the industrial disasters in brief. I will start with first with the Love Canal chemical waste dump disaster. In 1920, a chem company Hooker Chemical turned an area known as Love Canal near Niagara Falls, US into a disposal site for the byproducts generated from the manufacturing of dyes, perfumes and solvents. In 1953, the site was filled and a thick layer of impermeable red clay sealed the dump, preventing chemicals from leaking out of the landfill. The dump site was purchased for urban expansion by company and it was damaged the red clay cap that covered the dump site below. It resulted into long-standing health issues and symptoms of high white blood cell counts and leukemia to people. Another disaster took place in Oppau, Germany in 1921. To loosen a 4,500-ton mound of ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate that had solidified, the workers at BASF Oppau site in Germany decided to use several dynamite charges. Unfortunately, resulting in a massive 125 meter long and 19 meter deep crater and a death of more than 500 people. In Texas, 1947, a French ship, the Grand Cam, was being loaded with over 2,000 ton ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Due to a fire in the ship, it exploded. The blast was heard over 240 kilometers away. There were around 3,500 injuries and 576 people were killed. Another industrial disaster happened in Flixboro, UK in 1974. Cyclohexane vapor leaked from a ruptured pipework at the site at Flixboro. This resulted in an explosion that killed 28 people and injured 36. In Italy, dioxin crisis occurred in Sivasso on July 10, 1976. An explosion occurred in a TCP245 trichlorophenol reactor in a chemical company in Italy. A toxic cloud escaped into the atmosphere containing high concentrations of TCDD, which is a highly toxic form of dioxin. In India, in 1984, the Union Carbide Gas Leak disaster occurred. In Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, poisonous methyl isocyanate MIC gas escaped from the Union Carbide India Limited pesticide factory. The cloud contained 15 metric tons of methyl isocyanate. The methyl isocyanate gas killed more than 15,000 people. We are all aware of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. It occurred in 1986 in Russia due to errors in the reactor design and error in the judgment in nuclear reactor 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine. 
cause cooling water to start boiling. Temperatures reached more than 2000 degrees Celsius causing fuel rot to melt. Extreme pressures in cooling water pipes resulted in cracks which caused steam to steam. The escaped stream caused an explosion slamming off the roof of the building, starting a major fire and forming an atmospheric cloud containing approximately 185 to 250 million curies of radioactive material. The staff members were hospitalized with acute radiation syndrome. Sandoz chemical spill is another chemical disaster. Due to fire in Sandoz agrochemical storehouse in 1986 in Switzerland, tons of pollutant entered Rhine River, turning it red and causing a massive mortality of wildlife downstream. The water pollutants were dinitroorthocrosol, parathione, disulfoton, Penetrothione, thiomitone, propitamphos, etrimphos, and metoxuron. In January 9, 2000, the Bayer Mari cyanide spill incident happened. 2000 cyanide, in 2000, cyanide used in gold mine in Bayer Mari overflowed into the rivers, zones, and discharge. This caused spill and surrounding a settling basin. This resulted in the release of water with very high cyanide concentration. The cause of the spill was a break in the dam that surrounded a settling basin. Very recently in 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster occurred. Following a major earthquake, a 15 meter tsunami disabled the power supply and cooling of three Fukushima Daiichi reactors causing three nuclear meltdowns, three hydrogen explosions, and the release of radioactive contamination. In 1962, Rachel Carson published a book titled Silent Spring, which is an environmental science book. Her book documented the adverse effect of the indiscriminate use of pesticides on the environment. This book brought environmental concerns to the public and led to nationwide ban on DDT of DDT for agriculture. In view of the various disasters caused by industries, various laws were given by government to control pollution. One of the law is the Pollution Prevention Act of 1990. According to the Pollution Prevention Act of 1990, it is the policy of the United States that pollution should be prevented or reduced at the source. If pollution cannot be prevented, it should be recycled. If pollution cannot be prevented or recycled, it should be treated in an environmentally safe manner. Environmental Protection Agency EPA, founded by President Richard Nixon, began operational on December 2, 1970. The agency conducts environmental assessment, research and education. The Pollution Prevention Act requires the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, to establish an Office of Pollution Prevention, develop and coordinate a pollution prevention strategy, and develop source reduction models. In 1995, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency received support from President Bill Clinton to establish an annual awards program highlighting scientific innovations in academia and industry that advanced green chemistry. Now, let us have an introduction to green chemistry. Before that, let us see some of the significant advances in the field of green chemistry. Green chemistry was born around 1990. The term green chemistry was coined by Anastas, and Paul Anastas is known as the father of green chemistry. Paul Anastas and John C. Werner co-authored the groundbreaking book Green Chemistry Theory and Practice in 1998 and they outlined the 12 principles of green chemistry. In 1992, Roger Sheldon proposed the term environmental factor or E-factor. The green chemistry movement received a boost in 2005 when three scientists, Chauvin, Grubbs and Schrock, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for simplifying the process of synthesizing carbon compound, which is called metathesis process. The Nobel Prize Committee said, this represents a great step forward for green chemistry, reducing potentially hazardous waste through smarter production. 
Metathesis is an example of how important basic science has been applied for the benefit of man, society and the environment. Now let us see what is green chemistry. Green chemistry is the utilization of a set of principles that produces or eliminates the use or generation of hazardous substances in the design, manufacture and application of chemical products. Green chemistry, also called sustainable chemistry, is an area of chemistry and chemical engineering focused on the designing of products and processes that minimize the use and generation of hazardous substances. According to the United Nations Commission on Environment and Development, sustainability is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now let us see the need for green chemistry. We all know there is an increasing pressure from both society and government for chemistry-based industries to become more sustainable through development of eco-friendly products and processes that reduce waste and prevent toxic substances from entering the environment. In order to prevent further environmental damage and to encourage more young people into the industry, the public acceptability needs to be raised by adoption of greener and cleaner processes and green product design. With global warming being accepted as the biggest environmental challenge, the chemical industry must also develop more energy efficient processes and reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. This can be achieved through development of more environmentally benign products using less hazardous processes and raw materials. Now here comes the role of chemists. Analytical chemists have a role in detecting and monitoring environmental problems. The physical chemists have been involved in developing models for environmental phenomena. Atmospheric chemists have studied stratosphere ozone depletion and the greenhouse effect. The role of synthetic chemist has been to design synthetic pathways to produce target molecules for the least cost in the greatest yield. Chemists must try to make the work they do and the substances they use as environmentally benign as possible. Now, here are the goals of green chemistry. With knowledge of how to manipulate and transform chemicals coupled with the basic hazard data, chemists can try to reduce or eliminate the risk posed to themselves and society. They decrease environmental and health concern while developing efficacious process and methodology. Another goal of green chemistry is about more resource efficient and inherently safe design of molecules, materials, products and processes. The major objective of green chemistry is to meet the needs of the society in ways without damaging or depleting natural resources on the planet. Another goal of green chemistry is to meet the present needs without compromising the needs of the future generation. According to green chemistry, it in should introduce sustainable living, develop renewable energy, decrease production of waste. The goal of green chemistry is to conserve the utilization of natural resources. Green chemistry aims to create products which are reusable and recyclable. Green chemistry aims to invent alternatives to the practices which adversely affect the human and environment. So these were some of the goals of green chemistry. However, there are certain limitations in pursuing the goals of green chemistry. These are the initial cost of setup or development which can be expensive, lack of information or knowledge, no known alternative chemical and raw material inputs available, no known alternative process technology, lack of appropriate regulatory framework, lack of skilled persons, low yielding processes, determining toxicity of new compound is sometimes difficult. So these are some of the limitations of green chemistry. Now, let us see the principles of green chemistry. There are 12 principles of green chemistry. The first one is prevent waste. Second, maximize atom economy. Third, design less hazardous chemical synthesis. Fourth, design safer chemicals and products. Fifth, use safer solvents and reaction conditions. Sixth, increase energy efficiency. Seventh, use renewable feedstock. Eighth, Avoid chemical derivatives. 
Ninth principle is use catalysts, not stoichiometric reagents. Tenth principle is design chemicals and products to degrade after use. Eleventh principle, analyze in real time to prevent pollution. Twelfth principle is inherently safer chemistry for accident prevention. These twelve principles were postulated by Paul Anestes and John Werner. Then they were published in their book, Chem Green Chemistry Theory and Practice in 1998. 1998. Now, let us see the statements of each of these principles. The first principle states, it is better to prevent waste than to treat or clean up waste after it is formed. The second principle states, synthetic matter should be designed to maximize the incorporation of all materials in the process into the final product. The third principle states, Wherever applicable synthetic methodology should be designed to use and generate substances that possess little or no toxicity to human health and the environment. According to the fourth, uh, fourth principle, chemical products should be designed to preserve efficacy of function while reducing toxicity. The fifth principle states the use of auxiliary substances should be made unnecessarily wherever possible and innocuous when used. The sixth principle states energy requirements should be recognized for their environmental and economic impacts and should be minimized. Synthetic methods should be conducted at ambient temperature and pressure. According to the seventh principle, a raw material or feedstock should be renewable rather than depleting wherever technically and economically possible. The eighth principle states unnecessary derivatization, blocking group, protection, deprotection, temporary modification of physical chemical process should be avoided whenever possible. According to the ninth principle, catalytic reagents are superior to stoichiometric reagent. The tenth principle says chemical products should be designed so that at the end of their function they do not persist in the environment and break down into innocuous degradation products. The 11th principle states, analytical methodologies need to be further developed to allow for real-time in-process monitoring and control prior to formation of hazardous substances. The last principle, 12th principle says, substances and the form of a substance used in a chemical process should be chosen so as to minimize the potential for chemical accidents including release, explosion and fires. So these were the 12 principles of green chemistry by Paul Anastas and John Werner. There are certain books which can be referred. Book of Green Chemistry and Introductory Text by Mike Lancaster. Another book is Green Chemistry Theory and Practice by Paul Anastas and John Werner. One more book is An Introductory Text on Green Chemistry for Undergraduate Students by Indu Taka Sidwani and Rakesh Kumar Sharma. So this is here we end this uh, video on green chemistry introduction. Now we will have more videos on the various principles of green chemistry in detail with examples. Thank you for listening.